Pediatric Center of Excellence, Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Actually, Tehran University of Medical Sciences is the oldest and most well-known medical center in Iran nationally, as well as internationally. It also has the largest schools of medicine. Over 100 specialized research centers are under the immediate supervision of this university. Tehran University of Medical Sciences contributes to international medical and health education, research and professionalism to the benefit of global community through the uh, exchange of knowledge, sharing of resources, and developing global cooperation and collaboration. Children's Medical Center was selected as the hub of excellence in pediatrics in 2008 by Ministry of Health and Medical Education. Our hospital services and facilities are open to all nationalities, irrespective of race, color, and creed. We believe that our ability to deliver the best health care is made possible, possible through our team of highly trained, dedicated, and committed professionals within our medical, nursing, and clinical services. So after a lot of bragging and boasting, I'd like to take a moment to thank our keynote speaker, Professor Kent Himmel, child abuse pediatrician from Penn State Health Children's Hospital, and our dearest panelists for joining us. I would also like to uh, take this opportunity to uh, thank Vice Chancellor for Global Strategies and International Affairs, Directorate of International Relations of Tehran University of Medical Sciences for giving me the privilege to patron this important event. I also like to thank our dearest audience for joining this event. And I gotta tell you, we weren't here if it wasn't for Dr. Ziyari and Dr. Awai. Thank you, uh, thank you so much for making all this happen. A few reminders before we get started, a recorded version of this webinar will be available on our YouTube. Information about our social media is provided on the chat section. Due to the number of participants, make sure to mute your microphones during the lectures. We encourage you to ask them via chat section. And there's a webinar tool called Raise Hand, and we will be able to hear from you live after each lecture. Please feel free to ask questions at any point during the presentations using the chat section at the bottom right of your screen. We will uh, receive a reserved time at the end of each presentation to answer questions. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible throughout to, uh, today's webinar. For those of you just joined us, welcome to the seventh online pediatrics webinar. In today's webinar, we will be covering Munchausen syndrome by proxy. So with that, we will open today's webinar. We are very lucky to have us today, Professor Kent Himmel, Child Abuse Pediatrician, Penn State Health Children's Hospital. Professor Himmel, we are all ears. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning on the East Coast of the United States. It's afternoon where you are. Um, I've had my coffee. Um, I, I didn't prepare a formal presentation. Um, I think, uh, as I understood it, I was to discuss um, or add commentary um, to provide some insight about my experience in dealing with Munchausen syndrome by proxy. So I'm happy to do that. Um, I looked at the poster and saw that the faces represented on the panel included pediatric cardiology, intensive care, nephrology, endocrinology, neurology, gastroenterology. So my presumption is that this poor child is um, receiving requests for medical interventions and care from multiple specialists and subspecialists, um, having thus driven you to be concerned about Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Um, I don't know where you are as a cadre of treating physicians um, regarding the certainty of your diagnosis or whether or not there is still debate among you. Um, and so um, we can, uh, I can ask either to have you clarify a little bit about the status of this case, or I can give you sort of my overview about how we typically proceed. Well, thank you. So, if, you're, uh, if you agree, we can present the case and then we will have your key points. If you yes, I think agree. that makes, that makes okay. sense. Okay, that's a great thing. I think so. Let's first uh, introduce today's panelists as well, and then we will present the case. 
Here we have Dr. Reza Sherwin Bad, Associate Professor of Pediatric Neurology and Epileptology and Head of Children's Medical Center. Dr. Farzana Abbasi, Pediatric Endocrinologist. Dr. Mohammad Taqi Majnoon, Assistant Professor of Pediatric Cardiology. Dr. Parisa Rahmani, Pediatric Gastroenterologist and Hepatologist. Dr. Fahima Asgaryan, Assistant Professor of Pediatric Nephrology. And we are so happy to have with us Dr. Ehsan Agai Mogaddam, Assistant Professor of Pediatric Cardiology. And we have my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Aylar Ahangari, Medical Intern. Now, I would like to ask my friend, Dr. Aylar Ahangari, to present the case. Dear Dr. Ahangari, would you please? Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening, dear uh, professors, colleagues, uh, I'm so honored of presenting in such a nice, uh, wonderful scientific meeting uh, as the, the uh, seventh international case presenting conference. Uh, I'm so thankful to my uh, dear professor, Dr. Aurai, to uh, pro provide us such a this, uh, chance to have these meetings. And uh, many thanks to Professor Himel to, uh, Himel to accept our invitation to join the conference. Uh, first, I want to share my uh, slides. If you let me. Sorry, I think I'm not the co host. Yes, you are not the co-host, and I would like to ask Dr. Agai if it's possible, please make her the co-host so she could share her slides with us. And Dr. Abdul Mohammadian, I think she is the co Oh co yes, it's okay. Yes, it's okay. Yes, now yes, you're sorry. now your co-host. Yes. Yes. Thanks a lot. Okay. <laughs> As all you know, uh, the session is related to Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Uh, first of all, I want to start with some identifying information about our case. Uh, our case was a three-year-old three girl uh, who was the second child of a um, four-person's uh, family, second child of two. Uh, the girl was delivered by uh, NVD. Uh, in a gestational age of 39 weeks with uh, three kilograms of birth weight uh, from a mother of G2, P2, uh, abortion uh, zero and uh, leave one. Uh, this case was under treatment as a case of uh, FC febrile conversion since uh, January of 2020. Uh, the girl was presented to the emergency department of Children's Medical Center with uh, complaining uh, as complaining of uh, seizure attacks, some attacks that uh, I mean near to some uh, seizure with upward gaze, uh, central cyanosis, uh, cyanosis in lips, and uh, tremor in extremities. Uh, as the girl uh, man entered the room. Uh, she was uh, claudicating in left leg. The mother reporting uh, positive post ictal phase uh, and uh, decreasing of urinary output. The mother um, stated that the girl was uh, sleepy during the day. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, in, January, in January 2020, uh, our patient experienced uh, an attack of febrile conversion, uh, but she was uh, three months seizure free uh, after that febrile convulsion. But uh, another attacks started at the moment of emergency uh, meetings uh, that at the time that she uh, arrived to the emergency department. That attack was with this uh, symptoms, upward gaze, lip cyanosis, and extremities tremor. The mother showed us three uh, videos uh, of her attacks. In these videos, as uh, we were watching, the kid was playing. Suddenly, her behavior was changed. Then we uh, faced a behavioral arrest and slightly loss of consciousness. 
uh, the uh, her consciousness is slightly decreasing and decreasing. Suddenly, respiratory rhythms changed, uh, started to be tachypanic, and suddenly apnea happened. And uh, as I mentioned, central cyanosis and upward gaze, the last symptoms of the attacks. The point is, with um, in all of three videos, there is no onset, and all of the videos uh, were from the middle of the attacks. I want to mention about uh, past histories. First of all, the patient medical history. Uh, as the mother stated, no insult during pregnancy or delivery, delivery were reported. Just as I mentioned, history of FC eight months ago, followed by non-febrile seizure episodes. Uh, her vaccination was completed. Uh, the patient was under treatment with Tegretol, Zonizamide, Clobazon, Walprot, Sodium Walprot, Levabel, and Primadone after the febrile convulsion uh, episode. The family history uh, was negative. Parents uh, have no familiar relationship without any uh, previous story of seizure, epilepsy, or other medical condition in uh, parents or the first child. Then we go through some physical examination. Uh, first of all, uh, as mm, general uh, statements, the patient was conscious, alert, active, not ill or toxic, without any respiratory distress. The vital sign was completely normal, as I mentioned in the slides for you. Uh, the physical examination in the head and neck part was completely normal. Uh, in the chest part, lungs were clear without any sound reduction, heart uh, sounds were clear without any uh, abnormal or additional sounds, uh, abdominal examination was completely normal without any distension, organomegaly or tenderness, uh, genitalia was completely normal and at the end, extremities uh, sh uh, showed no deformity, edema, cyanosis, clubbing, or uh, anything. Uh, these stop pulses were completely symmetric and fully palpable. Uh, also, in uh, neurologic examination, we have uh, find no positive pathologic findings, and all reflexes were normal. Uh, through these findings, we uh, make up some uh, differential diagnosis uh, that I want to share with you. You think of epilepsy, uh, that uh, subgroup of and focal seizures, uh, arrhythmia induced seizure like or metabolic conditions or toxic. According to this differential diagnosis we made, we go through some paracetamol. First of all, lab data. As you can see, uh, I don't want to take uh, the time you, uh, that you can see uh, the uh, all details of the lab tests on your screen, but I want to mention that all the lab tests, CBCs, uh, coagulation tests, TFTs, urine analysis, uh, BC and UC, uh, urine toxicology, uh, and other tests were completely normal. Uh, after the uh, emergency department visit, to the patient at neurology ward. Uh, after the admission, oral medication was continued as he, uh, as she, sorry, as she uh, was getting before. Just we changed uh, sodium water to IV uh, route, and we add locosomite to the treatments. Then due to continuing of uh, apnea attacks, uh, we think of ICU admission and we transferred the patient to the ICU to, uh, for better monitoring and uh, taking care of the patient uh, because of these repetitive uh, attacks. Uh, as I mentioned, again in ICU, these apnea attacks and slight loss of consciousness episodes uh, continued and also some soft neurology uh, are added to the were added to the patient's symptoms, same as uh, showing some tremor uh, when she or uh, she wants to stand up. Uh, then 
we decided to have a multidisciplinary consultation meeting. In this consultation meeting, uh, we uh, decided to uh, make an ICU admission for the patient. Uh, because we decided to do some cardiac workups in, old, in order to uh, check the uh, heart's activity and also because of the uh, frequency of these attacks, uh, the girl had to be under full monitoring. So the patient admitted to cardiac intensive care unit. In CICU, uh, the patient undergone Holter monitoring that shows us, showed us rate related rate uh, right bundle branch block that stated to be normal. Then we made some uh, paraclinical uh, uh, findings like chest X-ray, EEG, VEM, MRI, MRA, and MRV, uh, that all of them were completely normal for the patients. As I mentioned, metabolic tests uh, and uh, some metabolic tests were done for the patients and hospital-based toxicology were sent, uh, were reported and all of them were completely normal. So the epilepsy uh, ruled out, kind of ruled out uh, because we have no paraclinical assessments. Uh, Arrhythmia-induced seizure-like movements can, can, can I mean, kind of rule out uh, because of normal Holter EKG monitoring. Metabolic tests were completely normal, so uh, we can't think of metabolic. Con we couldn't think of metabolic conditions. Also, because of uh, two or three times negative uh, toxicology examinations, toxic syndromes were also ruled out. Now, the thing that comes to the mind may be Munchausen by proxy. Uh, at the progress, uh, the patient's neurologic syndromes were improved, improved, and uh, the frequency of it. So we change IV medications to oral ones and reduce medications to the number of two. After the patient further of being under study and come to the clinics for follow-up studies as an outpatient discharged. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks, dear, for sharing this interesting case. And we shall proceed to the discussion. Professor Hummel here was, I believe we need uh, to rule out any other medical conditions to uh, make the final diagnosis. But I myself, as a pediatric resident, I always ask myself, what should I do to confirm my diagnosis? What are the special medical conditions that I should rule out? And how can I uh, make sure that there is nothing organic going on? We would like to have your points here. Um, I um, am a general pediatrician who has specialized in child abuse pediatrics. And so like those of you who practice general pediatrics, I rely on my subspecialists to help me um, confirm or exclude the more rare or obscure, or obscure conditions that could cause such a presentation. Um, I can't speak with any significant degree of authority to suggest that I too have an explanation that is a medical diagnosis. Um, I have questions um, that um, might help me to confirm or exclude Munchausen with greater certainty. Um, I would like to ask the neurologist involved, is the workup sufficient to definitively exclude epilepsy? I'm not a neurologist, but my, my um, experience or training has been that, of course, EEGs can be normal, and yet patients can have epilepsy. And so I'm curious about the confidence with which that has been excluded. Um, I have questions about the apneic attacks that occurred in the hospital prior to transferring to the PICU. Who was present? Were they observed from the onset? Um, and were they observed uh, by anyone um, with medical training? How about I just stop there and we discuss those questions uh, before proceeding? Yes, of course, here we have Professor Bad, head of Children's Medical Center and a pediatric neurologist and epileptologist. I would like to ask him about these questions. Professor Bad, we are all with you. 
Uh, hi, thank you for having me and uh, welcome to Professor Himmel uh, for joining us. Uh, this is a difficult question, but uh, some suspicious points uh, we saw about this child. Uh, one, uh, we never saw any events uh, when uh, the um, child was alone uh, and we saw um, um, the events when the mother next to her. Uh, for example, one event, one event that we saw was uh, when we decided to discharge her with normal EEG and normal good condition. And uh, uh, um, suddenly the mother said that uh, the child um, uh, didn't uh, breathe and uh, the CPR was done. And the second point was in VEM, video EG monitoring. In a 48 hour full monitoring, full, full video monitoring, we didn't uh, see any interictal uh, EG abnormalities. And when the cameras, uh, um, uh, when the cameras off, uh, suddenly a mother shot that uh, my uh, kid is uh, suffering from apnea and uh, another CPR was done at, uh, at this point. And uh, the third one uh, was in uh, PICU, when their mother was close to her and uh, um, our colleague said that uh, maybe she uh, feed her with some pills or something like this. And after a few minutes, the uh, baby uh, was deteriorated and uh, another opnic uh, attack and a spell uh, was seen. And these are suspicious. And in all of the attacks, we didn't uh, see her father. Uh, and uh, we only meet the mother uh, with the child and it is um, for us unusual. And uh, all of her ages was normal and uh, unfortunately we did not capture any uh, ihtar event to uh, um, have a um, definite diagnosis for her. So thank you. Um, so let's just to clarify, it's your impression that Munchausen's is at least a very real possibility in this case? Yes. Okay, very good. No, um, I surprised me. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, if if I may, I want to add something to the, uh, Dr. Bath's uh, uh, history. Uh, there was also uh, a very suspicious trend in this kid towards uh, men, and uh, she was uh, somehow afraid uh, from women. You know, I myself, uh, because uh, this kid was uh, in a period uh, she was admitted in CICU, cardiac ICU. And uh, I was involved with the uh, process, uh, treatment process of this child. Uh, I just asked the kid that, uh, uh, do you want to spend your time with your father or you, do you want to spend it with your mother? And uh, she actually was a very uh, clever baby, you know. And uh, she just told me that uh, she wants to spend his, uh, her time uh, with his father and she, pre uh, she preferred to even uh, uh, spend her time uh, in CICU with our, uh, uh, with our men nurses. Uh, and uh, she does not uh, want to spend all of his time with uh, the nurses that uh, were women, you know? And uh, this was also some, uh, somehow um, uh, suspicious in a child, you know, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. That sounds concerning to me as well. Um, so the mother was always the only person with the child in the hospital, in the room, at the time that the in-hospital events occurred. Yes. yes, professor. And is there um, an emerging opinion or consensus that something such as smothering could explain all of the medical findings observed or documented in when the child had these spells in the hospital, or is? Is there an emerging idea among you of what the inst what mother may have done to the child? 
No, I don't believe smothering is the uh, possible, you know, happening. Okay, but she did, you, there has truly been observation of apnea, cyanosis, alteration, or loss of consciousness. Um, and so is there an, um, any explanation that you have come to believe might explain those signs and symptoms produced precipitously or acutely by the parent? You know, actually, we were going to ask your experience because it was a mysterious case for us too. In fact, we were going to ask you what is your experience regarding these kind of patients? What special points that should we we, we should consider for the next patients to uh, make sure that is it uh, smothering? Is it whatever? It yeah, is. yeah. Um, I'm concerned about the um, duration of smothering that would have been required to induce apnea, seizures, cyanosis, etc. And it makes me um, it makes me concerned about the motivation, the, 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 the determination of the mother of the mother potentially to create those events. I would think it would take quite a while in an otherwise healthy three year old to induce all of those documented signs and symptoms. So that certainly concerns me. I can't say that I have a definitive potential explanation as to what mother said or what mother did to cause those acute spells. Um, but I view them as dangerous and obviously life-threatening as, as, as I'm sure all of you view. Um, what I can do is discuss a little bit about um, our approach moving forward. Um, part of me um, was concerned or is concerned that the spells will worsen. Um, but this case is somewhat unique than those that I have had because I've primarily dealt with Munchausen's in situations where a parent is, is requesting excessive tests, excessive treatments, excessive interventions, which can be harmful and are potentially unnecessary. And this is a slightly different case. You're asking if I have an explanation for the acute spells. And I can't say that I can't say that I have a definitive explanation. If, and so I'm not sure that this patient is precisely similar to those that I have experienced. Um, I can discuss how we have handled those more routine, those more predictable cases, those more um, common cases, at least in our experience. But I realize it's not gonna be as great a help to you dealing with this with this family. Um, shall I proceed in that direction? Or yes, is, are course. there other yes, special- Yes, yes, Because we, uh, we do not have much cases like this and we would love to okay. share it. Okay. So again, I apologize. I'm not smart enough to figure this out for you just like that. Um, so Munchausen's is a situation where a parent is inducing or creating signs or symptoms that then trigger medical professionals to um, prescribe additional treatments or order additional tests that create potential for harm. Um, and therefore, physicians are the real persons inducing harm in the, in the patient. Um, we physicians have different thresholds for ordering tests and for ordering treatments. Some are prone to order and treat, some are less prone and more prone to observe and, and, and watch before doing so. And of course, parents are different. Parents can be demanding and want all the tests in the world and lots of treatments and early and aggressive treatments and some are comfortable with observing and watching. And so in my experience, Munchausen's tends to occur when you have that combination of one or more physicians a bit too anxious to diagnose, treat, prescribe, order, and a parent who is too demanding and wanting everything in the world done and aggressive and early treatments. And so I caution all of us just as a general statement as physicians that we should think and be cautious um, when deciding to order increasingly, um, uh, increasingly uh, frequent or um, potentially dangerous tests, treatments, et cetera. With that said, if I have a situation where I think a parent is inducing illness and I think that I've reasonably excluded the possibility that she is exaggerating illness, not inducing illness, then the process we've gone through is as follows. Um, 
and it's it's labor intensive and admittedly it's not always successful um we ask one person to re obtain and review all the available medical records and to create a chart um, the chart can have column headings of chief complaint positive physical exam findings the diagnosis made at the time, the treatments or recommendations and comments. If one goes through those and creates a chart in chronological order, the goal then would be to look for parental misrepresentations of what prior physicians have said or recommended. If you document misrepresentations over time by the parent, where the parent is misrepresenting what the last physician said to the next physician, you can and should begin to suspect manipulation by the parent to get physicians to do what really they, they don't want to do um, and perhaps shouldn't do. If indeed that is the suspicion, then the next step that we hold, which that we take, which is challenging, is to try to get all of the treating physicians, that is the general and specialist physicians together. That alone is challenging because everyone is very busy. Um, and the goal of that conference, if at all possible, will be to discuss the results of that chart review to describe any misrepresentations by the parent and to, bait, and to debate the likelihood of Munchausen syndrome versus the possibility of actual rare disease. But if there can be consensus achieved that Munchausen syndrome by proxy is indeed a reasonable diagnosis, then there has, in my opinion, to be movement as a group forward, a consensus plan by all physicians engaged in the child's care. It would be something that you would undertake if and when everyone agrees that proceeding further with individual interactions with this family could create danger and harm. It's, it would proceed if and when the physicians agree that Munchausen is a reasonable enough concern and the child is reasonably enough stable that you agree as a group to stop, pause, slow down, and come up with a unified plan. Um, at that point, if the physicians involved all think this is a reasonable next step, then we inform our risk management department in our hospital to let the hospital administration know that you're dealing with a potentially higher risk patient. And um, they may have some, they have had for me other supportive interventions um, that um, may inform best um, management. Um, at that meeting, if consensus is achieved to slow down and form formulate a unified approach moving forward, then I believe the next um, deliverable would be the drafting of a medical plan for this patient. That is the consensus of all of the involved. Now this is labor intensive and I apologize. It doesn't, the plan itself doesn't have to be very long. It should include, I think, an introductory statement that you have met and you've put your heads together and you've considered the differential diagnosis and the workup and you believe that the good news is that you believe the child is overall healthy and that you have exhausted a thorough evaluation to exclude rare or dangerous conditions. And therefore you agree as a group that it's safe to slow down, wait and watch. Um, that should be probably the opening paragraph of that plan. Um, the next paragraph or the next point that should be included is that you think it would be wise that the patient's care for moving forward um, be um, uh, originated by a sentinel single physician. In other words, a gatekeeper physician should be identified among you to be the person who knows of this patient, um, who the parent agrees will be the person they go to first if they have new medical problems or new concerns. Because that gatekeeper physician hopefully will filter those concerns which warrant more intervention or specialty engagement from those that um, can be handled with reassurance. That person ideally is a motivated, strong, capable primary care provider who will not easily be manipulated, right, into ordering additional tests. Um, 
So those two main components of the medical plan, I think should be put in writing. Then I believe a period of, the third statement is we have also agreed that a period of observation at this point and serial um, exams um, is the best next step rather than moving forward with anything more aggressive in terms of diagnostic testing or treatments. Um, that's usually it. I, we have had all of the involved physicians sign it and then we've asked, um, and then we've brought, had a second meeting where we brought the parent in with as many of the physicians as are available to present the summary and the written plan to the parent and ask the parent to sign it. In other words, the parent is now agreeing to an approach to control the, dis, the, the dispersive provision of care the, uh, and, to, and to mandate, agreeing to a plan to mandate a coordinated unified approach to the patient's care. Um, the family typically in my experience has not had any objection at those meetings because it's hard to argue with a consensus impression of best next steps that involves all of you highly qualified subspecialists. Um, if the parent signs it, we then enter it into the medical record. Um, the reason we do this is because now there is a medical record, a written record or document, which um, the parent has agreed to follow. And if the parent then diverts and begins to seek independent care or care from one of you in isolation, then um, it becomes a red flag and potentially something that can um, be acted upon. Um, now, in my, in my country, we have child protective services and they typically would act um, much more readily on um, if we have evidence of a parent who failed to follow a consensus written plan documented and signed by the parent and put in the medical record. And I suspect that you may not have the same um, potential intervention by the local or state or, or, or national agencies that, that might have some role in protecting children. And so I, I don't know that our approach or our system, our, you know, my, our approach here might not translate to what you have available to support you to protect children there. The only um, thing that comes to mind in my mind if a parent has failed to follow the written plan uh, is then that I would consider having then a discussion with the rest of the family, the father, the extended family members. In other words, you take it to the next level, whatever might create authority over the actions of the parent on the child. I'll stop there and see if that, if that created questions. I'm sorry, I, I rambled perhaps just a bit too long, but I hope it made some sense. No, that's all. It was so useful. Thank you for sharing this. So I got to summarize it first. We review medical records, making sure that parental mispresentations are not possible. Then we gather all uh, physicians to have, you know, different sessions. Then uh, we uh, stop the medications and moving forward, uh, waiting and watching is a um, possible, you know, way. Then we inform our risk management department and after that, we uh, draft a medical plan and later on we proceed with signing the approval by physicians and then uh, by the parents. Here I see some uh, questions in the chat section. The first one was, let me read it for you. Uh, they asked that, what are the obstacles of treatment of Munchausen by proxy syndrome? Um, in my experience, the greatest obstacle uh, by far is physicians achieving consensus um, because um, specialists involved typically have had experience or knowledge of rare conditions that might be hard to diagnose, lacking confirmatory tests and definitive diagnosis is not possible. It's more medical judgment. And so if failures have most often occurred, if and when a single physician engaged in the treatment of the child 
um, disagrees with the plan. Um, if they agree instead, if they believe instead that they know that this could be a specific rare condition and that they must in good faith continue to treat for trial for that, then it's very hard. Um, you, it's very hard to proceed. That to me is, is the greatest obstacle. The, the second, um, so I think that answers the question. Before you ask me the next question, I do want to comment on your summary, your review. You said about stopping medications. If you have achieved consensus and a written plan, then you might, um, you might succeed in achieving buy-in from the parent to stop medications in an inpatient setting. Let's safely stop the medications and observe the patient in the hospital. That gives you the opportunity to have multiple people observing that nothing else happens. And it gives um, uh, the parent some faith that you are concerned enough to do so in a safe environment. Okay, now ask me your next questions. Thank you, thank you for <laughs> teaching me that. Then they ask, what are the legal aspects of this syndrome in the US, which you answered us. And here in our country, we are working on it. Still, we have some issues to do about it. Uh, they asked, what should we do to a mother which is making harm to her child? <laughs> yeah, that is the big question. Um, in our country, doctors have, in most hospitals, including my own, have the authority to assume primary care responsibility for a child that we perceive to be in imminent danger. In other words, to take over parental rights caregiving rights for 24 hours um, until we get our legal folks involved, okay? And so if I believe that a parent is harming a child as an inpatient, I have the authority to do that, but only for 24 hours and only as an inpatient. Um, that might buy time for you to engage outside investigators, law enforcement, et cetera, whatever governmental agencies to support your next steps or to engage risk management. But I don't have legal authority to sever parental rights temporarily or permanently outside of a courtroom, a judge's actions. And so um, the agency who investigates um, concerns about abuse, maltreatment, neglect are child protective service agencies and typically in conjunction with police um, in our country and both typically become actively involved. It's only then that the evidence is summarized and we go to a judge to get parental rights temporarily uh, taken away until a fuller investigation can occur. Um, in my experience, if we can get parental rights temporarily revoked long enough to have the child cared for in a foster situation. And we can document that the spells stopped completely in the foster care situation. Then we can go back to the judge or um, to um, talk more about the evidence to present that additional evidence. But legal authority to do something to the mother or with the mother to restrict her access to the child we don't have that authority. Um, at best, even in a hospital, unless parental rights has been completely legally terminated, a parent, even a parent who we believe has abused their child, has the right to be in the hospital room with their child. Um, we cannot obstruct that. And so usually that is the case we're dealing with. And in those cases, if and when we have suspected Munchausen, we have then, um, as difficult as it is, put in place that the mother will not be alone in the room with the child. It, that's terribly hard um, to do. Um, we have also tried the 24-hour the video recording, the video observation. That is now very difficult to uh, implement here in this country. The legal authorities who have who have responded have basically said that if you are saying as a physician 
that the child is having spells that are potentially life-threatening and that you are, are hypothesizing that the parent is inducing those spells, then you need so much so that you want to video record it, then you need to have the ability to respond within seconds to an observation on the video so that you can resuscitate that child. And so if you cannot respond immediately, then you have no right to video record. And of course, having the ability to respond immediately is a major obstacle. Who wants, who can afford to sit and watch a video 24 seven? That's a lot of staffing. And so we've not, it's typically harder and harder um, to get that initiated at our hospital and at most hospitals in the US. And so we do our best to have the mother not in the room in isolation, but that is also a major challenge because nurses, doctors, technicians are all busy. And what excuse do you give? You know, it's, it's very hard. Um, did that sufficiently explain the legal steps and limitations? Yes, of course. You know, in fact, I hear some things that uh, it's just blow my mind blowing. And it's a beautiful <laughs> point of view that, you know, you, you do not use the cameras because I was going to ask uh, about the cameras and you answer the questions. So I would like to ask our audience if you have any questions, you can raise your hand, you can uh, write in the chat section or you can uh, even send it privately for the panelists. If you have any questions, we are all with you. And I, I can read that chat. What? What is your professional response when they accuse the medical team? In fact, we have no answer for that. Well, um, I once had the experience of the attending physician on the pediatric ward asking for a consult because she expected or suspected Munchausen's. And I came in the room and the doctor had told the parent what she suspected. And as the child abuse pediatrician, I walked in the room and I was chewed out um, by the physician. Uh, I'm sorry, by the, by the father who was absolutely furious that someone would accuse his wife of doing these things to the child. My ability to engage with that family was completely lost because the physician, the treating physician told them that was the reason I was coming. Um, I am all for complete openness and honesty with patients. I do not ever hesitate to identify myself as a doctor who's, who's been asked to evaluate the possibility of abuse. I do that every time, except in these cases, because I will get nowhere with the family uh, if they understand really what it is that we're expecting. And so I, work behind the scenes in these cases to facilitate the steps we outlined earlier, all the way through to the point of a conference among the physicians, and even to the point of being present when the second conference is held with physicians and parent. I do that all in the background so as not to inflame uh, and not to sever the potential because what happened in that case, they, they um, signed out of medical care against medical advice. They left the hospital and they no longer came back to receive care at our facility, which meant that the child continued to remain at risk. Well, that was shocking. You know, my heartbeat is, you know, <laughs> just increasing. Uh, Professor Badv, our uh, head of uh, hospital, is asking, what is your professional reaction with parents accuse the medical team? I got the answer. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think that was okay, what I was I know, I know. I mean, uh, what, how can we document it? You know, it's just uh, mm. disconnecting the parents from the hospital. It's not the answer. We want to, uh, the baby to be safe, and we are not sure when we disconnected uh, with them, what, what would happen to the baby. Right. I think that it behooves us to be our best professional selves and to not be accusatory at all until we've gathered the evidence, formulated a plan, given them an opportunity to follow the plan, and only then, if they refuse 
to follow the plan if the divert refuse to use the gatekeeper physician, if they seek independent care that puts the child at risk, only then do we reveal our concerns. Because again, just as you said so beautifully, um, Seville, the, the goal is to keep the child safe, not to stand firm against angry parents. Um, and of course, I'm sure as good pediatricians, that's what we all believe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ohangari was asking, in this case, as uh, Professor Agai told us, uh, the baby was afraid of the father. In this, ca in cases like our case that was presented- Actually, uh, was actually sorry. Uh, uh, she, was, uh, she was somehow uh, afraid of uh, her of mother, mother, not her father. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. In these cases, is, uh, is it uh, better to discuss it with another parent or not? Um, when you get to the point my experience has been when you get to the point that you are all convinced as a group, you've applied the plan, written the plan, she's signed it and now is diverting, that's the point where you have to go to outside authority. In my um, world, in my country, that would mean Child Protective Services, police and a judge, but it may be true in your world that that would be a time to try to speak privately to the extended family. My experience has been to speak privately without the suspected perpetrator, without the mother, um, just to speak privately just to the father is not the best idea. Ideally, if you could get the father and some extended family members, a small group, maybe the grandparents of the child, others who could provide some perspective um, after that discussion occurs. Let's say the father is combative, refuses to believe that his wife would be inducing these signs or symptoms. Um, it could be that his parents could later raise doubt in his mind that then it fosters cooperation. So when I have spoken independently to fathers, it has worked one time quite well um, because he had already begun to suspect, but the other times it did not work. And so, by the way, everything I've told you could be wrong because this is so difficult a challenge and every case is unique. And um, I can't say that I have an overwhelming experience. Um, I'm speaking really of a total of 15 or 20 such cases, all very labor intensive. But I think I have had lessons learned and those experiences have have informed the way I've handled it moving forward. Thank you, thank you so much. We uh, had a lot of, you know, we didn't have much experience in this era and uh, your enlightening and entertaining presentation was, you know, uh, one of a kind. Entertaining? So, of course it was, you know, uh, we had a professor, Professor Kadibar, I wish she, she was here. Uh, actually, she's retired and she had a lot of points of views in this era. And uh, I wish she was here just uh, talking to you and uh, you would uh, see that what are legal and, uh, you know, what are legal tools that we use in our country. But unfortunately, we do not have her here. So let's proceed to our panelists, but before that, here we have some surprises for you. Dr. Ohangari, please. Dr. Hungary, we do not have you here. Uh, actually, this uh, this will be uh, the first uh, uh, public presentation of uh, our thirty second Congress uh, on Pediatrics here in Tehran University of Medical Sciences Children Medical Center. Uh, I wish uh, I wish that the uh, uh, I wish that the clip uh, will be run on your computer, Dr. Ohangari. Uh, 
Okay, no problem. We can uh, we can do it uh, at the end of the session. So, uh, Dr. Abdul Muhammad, if it is possible for you, uh, we can go to our panelists and uh, we will listen uh, to what uh, they have to teach us. Yes, now it's time to ask Professor Bad to join us again with his speech. Uh, we want to ask you, when should we suspect Munchausen syndrome by proxy in a patient presented in neuro uh, by neurologic symptoms? Professor Bad, we are all with you. Uh, thank you so much. And I should appreciate again, uh, Professor Himmel for the nice presentation. I summarize my talk in uh, two or three minutes and uh, let me share my screen. Um, do you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet? I shared it. No? No, we do not have your screen. There really no problem. Uh, we will share it from here. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm just working on it. So uh, you can share it from uh, the main host of this session. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, the presentation of the topic. Thank you so much. Um, next slide, please, if possible. Uh, as Professor Himmel said, uh, Munchausen syndrome by proxy is a mental health problem in which a caregiver makes up or causes an illness or injury in a person uh, under his or her care, such as a child, an elderly adult, or a person who has a disability. Uh, because vulnerable people are the victims, Munchausen syndrome uh, by proxy is uh, a form of child abuse or elder abuse. Um, next slide, please. This is the spectrum of uh, healthcare seeking by parents from neglect to Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Uh, um, at the uh, left side, um, you can see the carelessness and um, at the right side, uh, you can see the aggressive behavior of caregiver. Um, next slide, please. Sometimes um, caregiver uh, play a crucial role to induce or facilitate the symptoms or signs in a child. And next, please. Uh, if uh, we talk about the, neurolog the neurologic presentation of uh, Munchausen syndrome by proxy, uh, we often uh, um, see um, some of these manifestations, such as uh, loss of consciousness or periodic loss of consciousness, seizure and epilepsy, recurrent ataxia or gait incoordination, and episodic apnea, which may be life treating. Next slide, please. We have a few uh, articles about the neurological, neurological manifestation of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. This article is an old article uh, published in 1994 in Journal of Neuroscience Nursing, but uh, um, there is some, uh, there are some useful points, such as epilepsy is by far the most common illness uh, falsified by mothers for their children. In fact, uh, one review of Munchausen syndrome by proxy cases shot 43% uh, presented with a primary diagnosis of epilepsy. And uh, the other point is another common neurological presentation of MSP is apnea, often uh, multiple life threatening episodes of apnea uh, occur in presence of only uh, one person. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
Uh, this is a Brazilian review of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. As you see, uh, the convulsion is uh, one of the most important presentations of common uh, factitious disorders in medical and surgical clinic uh, for uh, children. And next slide. Um, this slide is a contradictory um, slide uh, about the impact of internet. A review of Munchausen syndrome by proxy and uh, the internet allows caregivers to perform their own research and create expectations of which tests and management interventions are indicated. This challenges the clinician to balance the child's needs with parental demand. Social media can also be used by uh, dissatisfied families to punish physicians or hospital. And uh, sometimes they ask uh, more and more um, uh, tests and interventions for the child. And uh, the next, this is my uh, last slide. It's a poem from a contemporary poet from Iran. Uh, our words still remains untold. Once you hasten to start, it is the moment to depart. It is again the same account. Before you are informed, it will uh, be your fated moment to depart. Oh, the uh, constant grief and regret, how soon all of a sudden it becomes late. Thank you so much. I summarize my um, uh, slide presentation for uh, our limited time. Thank you, thank Thanks you, so Professor Bad. In fact, it was so informative, and the last slide was, you know, it was awesome. So uh, I want to ask Dr. Ahangari again, please, if uh, she could share the video clip with us. Uh, Dr. Angeri, we do not uh, have the sound of the clip, and uh, that's that's uh, because uh, under the page of your share screen, you should uh, choose uh, the sound, the audio from the computer. First, uh, you should open that and then share it, share it with us. Uh, Dr. Aray, would you please uh, describe one more time? I couldn't hear you. Um, under the page of the screen where uh, it is okay. written share screen, on yes. the page you can see the sign that uh, it should play with the audio from your computer. Just uh, click it. Just choose uh, the item. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Because otherwise, uh, you will not have. We will not have the sound of your clips. Just. Okay. Let's uh, try it one more time, and uh, if not, we can uh, go to our next speaker. Sadly, the sound is not okay. So, uh, Dr. Abdul Mahmadi, uh, please continue with our, with our speakers. Uh, I will share the clips uh, at the end of the session uh, through the main uh, host of the session. Uh, Dr. Aray, I will send you the clips. I'm so sorry for the inconvenience. I think I'm- No problem, no worries, problem. no worries. I'm Just so send them to me. Okay, for sure. Okay, so we shall proceed to the discussion with Dr. Abbasi, pediatric endocrinologist. Dr. Uh, Abbasi, could you please define the endocrine symptoms that related with Munchausen syndrome by proxy? Good evening, Thank everybody. I'm so happy uh, that uh, it's uh, with you. 
I try to share my screen. Can you see my slides? Can you see my yes, slides? Yes, yes, Professor, we can see them. Okay. Uh, let me get to start by a case presentation that uh, hospitalized uh, recently in our hospital. A two-year boy uh, with recurrent fibrocellular ischemia attack. With history of uh, initial diagnosis of uh, diabetes type one in 18 months of age. The first presentation of child was uh, diabetic hepatitis also. After that, he sorry, continued. Professor Abbasi. I think we have a little problem with your sound. Could you please talk a little louder, please? Yes, sure. Yes, sure. Is it better? Yes, it's better now. Uh, okay, after, after that, uh, he frequently hospitalized for, uh, for hyperglycemia attack and uh, DKA attack in emergency ward. So that in six months of hyperglycemia, uh, six months of after diagnosis of diabetes, uh, he hospitalized for DKA and hyperglycemia seven times. After diagnosis, uh, after diagnosis of, uh, of, uh, of the reason of uh, why he came to emergency ward more and more, more and more, uh, each time uh, he carefully evaluated for causes of hyperglycemia and the possible uh, causes of diabetic ketoacidosis. And uh, each time we reviewed the insulin dosage, the insulin uh, injection training, and uh, his diet uh, every time of hospitalization. Uh, the mother was cooperative and answered to all questions and cooperate well with uh, doctors and nurses. After all, uh, all medical investigations, uh, of course, without uh, clear result, uh, we, uh, we realized that she has a big problem with her husband at home, and every time the baby become ill, the father uh, was absent. Uh, we decided to refer her to psychiatric consultation. Uh, after interview um, with her, with her uh, we realized that every time she had problem with her husband at home, she proceeded to give plenty of sweet liquids and added extra sugar to foods, to uh, her boy's foods. And frequently, uh, she refused to inject insulin to the child. Uh, and uh, in order to rise the blood sugar and uh, to induce uh, symptoms of uh, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, like hyperkinemia and dehydration and so on. And he, uh, she came to an uh, emergency, emergency ward, worried, very worried, and her son and uh, hospitalized in uh, ICU and the our team manage uh, the DK and uh, sometimes hyperglycemia for, for him. Uh, um, about examples of Munchausen uh, proxy syndrome uh, in endocrine uh, fields, uh, uh, I mentioned here in this slide uh, some possibility like inducing coma by uh, giving drugs. Uh, in endocrine, the, the most common uh, drug that uh, the prototypes uh, give to a uh, victim is insulin and inducing uh, hyperglycemic coma. And the induction of hyperglycemia and otherwise hyperglycemia with some, uh, some drugs like insulin or glucoid uh, by caregiver. Uh, induction of hirsutism by uh, giving uh, drugs like progesterone and hypokalemia by uh, giving tonsomite. Uh, this is, a, uh, as you know, a diuretics. And uh, hypernatremia, hypernatremia, and hypernatremia 
can see, um, for example, uh, the proper tomato uh, give you extra salt to the child's food to, to induce hypermatrium of the child. Polyuria and uh, polydipsia uh, by giving diuretics and induction of tears to the child. And obesity, the, um, some case reports uh, is uh, uh, reported by colleagues about uh, inducing obesity in, in child by, uh, by mother or caregiver. And also Cushing disease, uh, I didn't mention uh, this item here. Cushing uh, syndrome, uh, which you can see uh, Cushing syndrome that uh, the perpetrator uh, or mother give the child uh, drugs like hydrocortisone or prednisone and, and so on, glucocorticoid uh, agents. Uh, as you know, medical child abuse is synonymous by uh, with uh, Munchausen by proxy uh, syndrome and refers to a child receiving unnecessary and frequently harmful medical care due to a, a caregiver exaggeration of symptoms or lying about the uh, medical history or simulating physical finding or sometimes uh, perpetrator uh, intentionally inducing illness in, in the child. And uh, when uh, we can diagnose, and how we can diagnose this, this, uh, this matter, this issue in, in a child that, um, and, and diagnose the medical child abuse, uh, refer to, uh, uh, we, should, we should be aware about this issue. And uh, we should know about this and think about that. Uh, and if uh, we cannot uh, diagnose this, maybe uh, many medical um, interventions that uh, we, we, we have done and, and uh, we lay down for, for a child uh, for, for nothing, and, uh, it is factitious illness. Diagnosis of uh, Munchausen um, proxy um, by proxy. Um, related to a physician, the main physician to recognize that the uh, caregiver is exaggerating or inducing illness in the patient or not. And uh, we as a physician uh, should be alert and should be um, aware about the and judgment, the quality of information we receive from uh, caregiver uh, before ma making uh, medical decisions uh, for, uh, for the child. And here is uh, a, a key question uh, that uh, we should ask and answer the, to these questions when evaluating the patient uh, that uh, supposed to uh, or she uh, is under the medical child abuse, like are the history, sign, and symptom of this disease, is iatrogenic harm to the child occurring? Is there uh, is iatrogenic harm who is causing this harm to you? Okay, the, the, these questions are key, key questions and are important, and uh, we should be aware about this, this matter. And in conclusion, when a physician um, realized a possible Munchausen uh, syndrome by proxy in a child, uh, consultation with a multidisciplinary child abuse team um, and the child abuse specialist is warranted in all situations where the physician suspects that the caregiver's appropriate actions are resulting in significant disruption to the child's activity, um, moder moderate medical child abuse or uh, potential life training, treatment and severe medical child abuse. Um, thank you for your attention and for your time.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arbasi. It was so informative. I believe my friend, Dr. Bakhtiari, has a question and will be uh, Dear Sevil, uh, just, uh, just, uh, just a moment. Uh, yes. I think Dr. Zia uh, is uh, now ready to play the uh, clips for us. Uh, and then we will go to uh, our next speaker. Thank you. Yes, of course. I got to tell that for our next event, our upcoming virtual conference, 32nd International Congress on Pediatrics will, uh, will take place between 2 to 6 November. We look forward to seeing you at this meeting, and we are sure you will find it an outstanding educational opportunity during the 32nd International Congress on Pediatrics 2010. So next, we'll uh, and have... also uh, I, I want to add a point. Uh, these clips uh, was uh, made uh, were made by my good friend Dr. Aylar Ahangari, uh, and thank you very much, Dr. Aylar, for your support and for your great help during the Congress. Uh, okay, let's uh, continue with uh, our. Uh, Dr. Ahanger, we didn't have your thank you because your sound was off. <laughs> Next, we will have Dr. Mohamed Taqi Majnoon, pediatric cardiologist, to tell us whether Munchausen syndrome by proxy can present like a cardiac disease. Are there any reports related to that? Dr. Majnoon, hi, thanks for joining us today. Hello, thank you. Thanks, audience, uh, for attending our conference and uh, thanks Dr. Awai for inviting me. Uh, let me share my slides. Anything happened? We have your slides here. Yes. Uh, Munchausen uh, syndrome is, very, is a very difficult uh, diagnosis and when it comes to proxy, it would be too difficult. I will ignore this because Dr. Professor Bass explained it. Uh, suspicion of Munchausen uh, arises from discrepancy between lab tests and clinical history, as we mentioned in our case in uh, our hospital. One of the most challenging situations for the addition is to recognize a fabricated or induced illness in a child especially if it closely resembles a well-defined disease or syndrome. And uh, as also Bad mentioned, uh, uh, at the time, because of uh, being internet in reach for all mothers and caregivers, it's very difficult to find out if it is factitious or uh, uh, real because many caregivers and mothers know many things about the disease. The clue for identification of factitious illness is often discrepancy between a complex medical history with frequent hospitalization for different symptoms. 
uh, and physical science and lab results along with poor response to treatment. Patient symptoms are out of proportion for physical findings and do not respond as expected to establish treatment in cases considered unusual or atypical and additional studies fail to uncover the satisfactory cause of symptoms. Uh, as we mentioned, a child disease is factitious uh, uh, or induced by a children, uh, by a caregiver in Munchausen syndrome by proxy and interaction with healthcare sy uh, system result is multiple, in multiple medical tests and procedures will happen and deniable caregiver or mother at the, uh, as the cause of child illness uh, is the other characteristic and symptoms abate following separation of child from the caregiver as Professor uh, Kimmel mentioned. Uh, <clears throat> in uh, cardiac uh, presentation of um, uh, Munchausen syndrome by proxy, we have some overlap with uh, neurologic uh, uh, department uh, as alter or apnea may happen and uh, it's very difficult to find out if it is a neurologic problem or it's a cardiac uh, problem as uh, our case here uh, has been under uh, cardiac and neurologic uh, observation and evaluation. And finally, it's very difficult to find out if the heart is okay or uh, uh, not. Another uh, cases may happen, uh, uh, may be given uh, some medications to a child as a child abuse, uh, causing with cardiac like inframin. Uh, as you know, inframin may cause lung QT and infamine poisoning may cause ventricular tachycardia. And uh, it has been uh, some cases ha happening not in our hospital, but uh, over the world. And uh, we would like to mention a case in London, in one of hospitals in London, a 20 month old girl has been admitted to hospital with a, a fever conversion. Uh, and uh, she has been doing well, but in his lab test, they found out, uh, find, uh, found out uh, hyperkalemia and uh, uh, some creatinine elevation. In several tests, it happened. And uh, in that hospital, it was usual to give uh, lab samples to mother to uh, take it to uh, lab. And uh, when uh, the staff took their sample themselves to the lab, they found out that hyperkalemia and azotemia didn't happen and the child was normal. And finally, they found out that uh, it was uh, her mother that add some urine to blood sample of the kid before taking to uh, uh, lab and uh, it was a factitious case. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if any question, I'm, I'm, I'm here with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Majnu. Let's see if there are any questions. I believe there are not. And next we will have Dr. Parisa Rahmani, pediatric gastroenterologist. Dr. Rahmani, hi, thanks for joining us today. Would you please share your experience of gastrointestinal manifestations of Munchausen syndrome by proxy? <laughs> Uh, Dr. Rahmani, uh, uh, I should uh, thank Dr. Rahmani to join us. Uh, uh, sadly, the, it was a familial disaster happened to uh, her family during the uh, previous week, uh, but uh, she agreed to uh, be with us uh, in this session. So thank you very much again, Dr. Rahmani, to join us during this session. And uh, if, you, if I may, I would like to ask you to just uh, keep the time uh, for about five minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Let's uh, okay. continue. Okay. Hi. Hi, Dr. Agaya and 
other colleagues. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm glad to invite me. Um, uh, I asked from uh, Dr. Bakhtiari to share my uh, to share my slides, please. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, thank you. I can explain. I explain the manifestation of Munchausen by proxy syndrome in pediatric gastroenterology. Uh, as my colleagues said, Munchausen by proxy it's a form of child maltreatment and a malignant disorder of preterm depletion and for adult falsifies signs and symptoms in a victim, causing that victim to be regarded as ill or impaired. The physician who is involved with this patient may unwittingly participate in this form of child abuse. In general, the child undergoes many unnecessary investigation and procedures. A broad scale of manifestations has been described of which gastroenterologic manifestations are a substantial part, such as vomiting, diarrhea, and failure to thrive, and either food allergy. I attempt to collect all manifestation of Munchausen syndrome by proxy that pediatric gastroenterology have observed to increase the awareness of the condition. In especially referral centers, gastroenterologists are commonly consulted in the situation of a young child who has recurrent apnea or a near miss sudden infantess in with surgery for gastroesophageal reflux is considered. Specialist Center for Intestinal Motility Disorder report on inflicted cases investigated for intestinal suit obstruction syndrome. Bizarre stories of fabricated illnesses are reported in patients supported by prolonged parenteral nutrition. There are several ways to obtain a rapid diagnosis. Heightened awareness, serious long lasting, incomprehensible symptoms, does not respond to current treatment, and repeated extensive physical examination may reveal clues for the correct diagnosis. Import to collect extensive data. Check out medical history of the mother and sibling. The child should be, uh, sometimes it needed the child should be separated from the parents and observed to see whether the symptoms disappear. I explain some manifestations of a Munchausen syndrome uh, by paroxy syndrome in pediatric gastroenterology, or so one of the important of them is chronic diarrhea. Mechanisms of fabrication, laxity, bicycle, phenethylene, magnesium, Glabrate salt, epicoxyrap, dilution of estol, recurrent enema with salty water, nutritional, giving to allergen to a child with calvamic allergy. Diagnostic procedure and uh, test consistent of toxicologic screening of fecus, mass spectroscopy, toxicologic screening of fecus, fecal magnesium, SAL emitting in body fluids, Osmolality and electrolytes in school. Manifestations of Munchausen by paroxysm syndrome in pediatric gastroenterology. The other manifestations are failure to thrive by withholding or dilution of food, supposedly allergic with insufficient diet, going the allergen to child with established food allergy. Diagnostic procedures and tests, gastric content, SAO formula, admit to hospital and fit appropriately. Vomiting and abdominal pain, the other manifestation of Munchausen syndrome in gastroenterology. Mechanisms of fa fabrication include imitating a vomit, by emetics, epicoxyrib, glycerol, poisoning, by salt, arsenic, all sorts of medications, Overdose of prescribed medication, malfeeding in a child with established GER, apparent life threatening event in child with uh, gastroesophageal re reflux, necessitate for fund duplication. Diagnostic procedures consist of admit to hospital, isolate from mother, as they from emitting in body the fluids, safe for glycerol in urine, toxicologic screening of body, and, and, and others. 
The other manifestation is hematemesis mechanism of fabrication include introducing a sharp foreign body into oropharynx, adding blood or pigment around mouth of the pillow. Diagnostic procedures and tests include admit to hospital, blood typing, labeling of erythrocyte. It's amazing that I said to you about cystic fibrosis can, cystic fibrosis can be imitated by mother, by influencing sweet taste, influ or father, by influencing, uh, influencing sweet taste, influencing fecal fat analysis, collecting sputum from cystic fibrosis patient, the diagnostic procedure and test can help us is bacteriologic screening. Central line complications such as breakage, leaks, frank dislodgement, injecting nanosteroid material into the line, retrieving blood, and the others are, uh, are exist, existed. Diagnostic procedures and that can help us is admit to hospital, bacteriologic screening, and blood typing. Hematochesia is the other manifestations. It can be fabricated by introducing a foreign body in the anus, adding blood or pigment to a stool, and diagnostic procedures and tests can be included admit to hospital, blood typing, labeling of erythrocyte. Canistipation is the other manifestation that can mechanism of fabrication is imitating the pseudo obstruction syndrome, diagnostic procedures and twists in its initial transit time, radiopaque markers, antrotheodinal manometry, and assay for laxatives and imaging. Other manifestations that I uh, can explain you is gastric erosion, malary waste tears, colitis, creating aftous ulcers in the mouth, cigarette burns and ingestion of foreign bodies. A substantial number of children with the Munchausen by Baraksi syndrome have gastroenterologic and nutritional manifestations. Therefore, a patient gastroenterologist should always be alert when treating children with the long lasting unexplained symptoms and the little or no reaction to a standard therapy. An extensive knowledge of deceptive mechanisms involved should be part of the training of every practitioner. By definition, we should uh, realize that the perpetrating parent is extremely cunning and that list of mechanisms of deception will never be complete. Thank you very much. If you have question, I would my uh, it would be glad to uh, answer with you. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Ahmoni. Next, we will have Dr. Asgaryan, pediatric nephrologist, to talk about how can we differentiate between the nephrologic symptoms and Munchausen syndrome by proxy and a real ne nephrologic disease. Dr. Asgaryan, hi, thanks for joining us today. Hello, everybody. I cannot share uh, my, uh, I cannot allow to share my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, I will share just, it. Uh, just wait a minute. Uh, we will share these slides for you um, uh, or make you the co-host so you can Professor, share Professor, I can share them. I have access. Oh, okay. I can share them. Okay. I saw yeah. them. Thanks okay. a lot. Uh, in the name of God, next please, uh, Dr. Abdul Mahmoud uh, uh, I would like to talk about the Munchausen syndrome by proxy, renal and urological uh, presentation. Uh, as I said, my uh, friends, uh, Munchausen syndrome by proxy is a persistent fabrication of illness done by a person to another. In the field of pediatrics, this is done by uh, parents, especially mothers. In 1995, a database was started and collected all data of uh, MSDP patients. Uh, and the results show that 25% of children had renal and urologic concerns. So the uh, renal uh, uh, presentation is not uncommon. The most frequent nephrologic signs of presentation were hematuria, urolithiasis, proteinuria, recurrent UTI, and acute renal failure. Uh, next, please. Next slide, please. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, each of these presentation uh, briefly. And first of all, I want to talk about the uh, 
hematuria the most frequent uh, presentation. Factitious hematuria can be fabricated by contaminating uh, urine with blood or coloring substances. Uh, in these situations, other laboratory results are normal. And if you uh, obtain a, a urine sample by medical staff, it will be negative for the presence of RBCs. Uh, next slide, please. The samples can be polluted by patient's blood or urethral manipulations, traumatism of external genitalia, or by caregiver's blood. If you want to find the source of the blood cells, you uh, can type in the patient's and caregiver's blood group and checking which matches to the urines. If the patient's and uh, caregiver's blood uh, group is simi uh, uh, has similar, you can uh, check the minor blood group instead of main blood group. Hematria can be secondary to drugs intoxication like anticoagulants such as warfarin or urine samples can be contaminated by culling substances such as pobidin iodine. iodine. In these situations, you, uh, uh, the urine samples will be negative, urine microscopy will be negative for the presence of RBC. The second presentation is proteinuria. Factitious proteinuria, which, sometime, which uh, sometimes can be in the nephrotic range, is never associated with hypoproteinemia or edema. Source of protein, uh, protein is an animal protein like eggs or can be human albumin. Urinary protein electrophoresis can be helpful by revealing almost pure albumin without transferring fraction. Next slide, please. Thanks a lot. The, sick, the third uh, presentation is urolithiasis. Stones or sand can be added to voided urines or inside the urethra to simulate renal stones. In these situations, mineral metabolic pattern of blood and spot urine reveal no abnormalities. And a stone analysis is very important for differential diagnosis by revealing an abnormal composition. Most of the time, these are pebbles. And at the end, urinary tract infections can be a presentation of a Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Factitious UTI can be recurrent. The infection can be due to exogenous contamination. For example, a small amount of feces mixed with the urine sample or can be induced by urethral manipulation. The urine culture can reveal the presence, the presence of unusual bacteria such as salivary organism or polymicrobial infection. And uh, uh, in this situation, there is no other sign and symptoms of urinary tract infections such as fever or dysuria or, uh, or puria or anything else. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, at the end, I, uh, we should keep in mind that uh, every doctor should consider MSPP as a possible diagnosis when there is evidence of uh, if there is the evidence of recurrent illnesses without a defined cause, or if there is uh, if there is discrepancies occurs between biochemical findings and clinical conditions, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Professor Asgerian. This was so informative. Unless there are any other questions from each and every one of us. Uh, at Children's Medical Center, we would like to Here's share- uh, I want to share uh, uh, just yeah. uh, my personal experience with you. Of course, and of course, uh, of course, uh, as a pediatrician, I have uh, been encountered with two different cases of Munchausen during my practice. Uh, first, uh, uh, there was a mother that uh, just add blood to the urine sample of her daughter and uh, her daughter was continuously uh, admitted to Moffitt Hospital. Moffitt Hospital uh, uh, for uh, hematuria, gross hematuria. And finally, uh, there was a resident that uh, find it sus uh, suspicious and uh, the blood sample from the child uh, was taken uh, for the blood group and uh, the puzzle was solved. And uh, another case that uh, I was encountered, uh, it was a case uh, of a child obesity uh, that uh, the child was injected by dexamethasone uh, by uh, his mother uh, for a long time. And uh, the child uh, was, uh, was involved with a severe obesity. 
and uh, abnormal uh, blood sugars. So uh, uh, although it's, it's very difficult to recognize uh, the cases, but uh, I think uh, with uh, such gatherings uh, like tonight, we can share experiences and uh, we can get more aware uh, of cases that uh, we do not usually think uh, there may be cases of Munchausen by proxy. Uh, I myself uh, want to thank all of our friends and uh, all of our panelists, and especially our keynote uh, lecturer and uh, my uh, our new good friend, uh, Professor Kent uh, Himmel. Uh, I know you are a very busy man, and uh, we hope uh, we can use your uh, we can enjoy uh, your knowledge um, uh, for next. Uh, or uh, for other sessions that we can share with you. And uh, uh, just that, uh, I want to thank all of you. Thank you for having me. I learned so much from all of you and you are all such gracious, gracious hosts and colleagues. Thank you for um, letting me join you. So thank you everyone from each and every one of us at Children's Medical Center. We would like to say a particular thank you to Professor Kent Himmel, one of the greatest child abuse pediatricians <laughs> whose support we are honored to have. Uh, we are honored to have, and despite the time difference, we were more than happy to get involved. A special thank you also goes to all our fantastic speakers from Children's Medical Center. Unless there are any other questions, I want to thank everyone who has participated on today's call. Thank you for your patience. Ne uh, again, I'm telling you for our next event, our upcoming virtual conference, 32nd International Congress on Pediatrics will take place between 2 to uh, 6 November. We look forward to seeing you at this meeting and we are sure you will find it outstanding educational opportunity during the 32nd International Congress on Pediatrics 2020. Again, thank you everyone for your patience. We appreciate your continued cooperation with us. Please submit your questions to us on our social media if you have anything as that you thought of after the, we conclude today's session. We will make sure to answer those questions. Thanks everyone, have a good afternoon. Yeah.